Hi, I'm Sabin Yaakov. This presentation is entitled One Pulse Nonlinear Inductor Measurement. There are some relevant videos in, to this presentation. Here are the videos. These are the links. And I'm going to print the links at the description section of the video that you are now watching. Practical inductors are sensitive to DC current. And as the current goes up, the inductance goes down. This is a typical plot of the differential inductance, which you will find in data sheets of inductors. And the reason for that is that the core of the inductor start to saturate, and as a result, the permeability or relative permeability is going down, and therefore the inductance is going down. The classical way of measuring the inductance would be then to inject a current, a DC current, into the inductor, and then to have some AC excitation. Here I'm showing a voltage, which this will be a small signal, a small amplitude AC signal at a given frequency. And then we measure the AC current through the inductor and the AC voltage across it. And then by uh, the impedance uh, equation or relationship, we find the inductance as the voltage over omega i, this is the current, the AC current through the inductor. Now, this is not simple to implement because you need a current source. And in some inductors, it's going to be a very high current. And then it has to be of high impedance. If you have just a power supply and you set it to a current limit, this will not do because the power supply has a capacitor at the output. And consequently, this signal will be actually shorted. So you need either a high inductance inductor, much larger than the test unit, or a active current source with a, say, MOSFET in the linear region. So it's not simple to implement. Another way of measuring the inductance would be by a single pulse, exposing the inductor to a voltage. Doesn't have to be a constant, could actually be dropping, and usually it will be dropping because when you load the source with the inductor at high current, you might have a group here in the voltage. And as a result of this constant voltage, here it is, then we are going to have the IDT, so the current will go up. At the beginning, it's sort of linear, and then the slope becomes steeper due to the fact that the inductance goes down, and then this will be the end of this uh, pulse. So what we are going to have is the inductor, a voltage which is imposed on it, measuring the voltage and the current, and conveniently, you can do it by a scope and then get the output, the digital output of the numbers of, of this uh, measurement. And then you can get the inductance by the ratio of the voltage divided by the derivative at any given time. So this would be an alternative way to measure the inductance with one pulse which is kind of simpler than the impedance method, but it has its own shortcomings, and I'm going to point them out later on in this presentation. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to explore by simulation this method of one pulse measurement of an inductor. I don't have here actual test measurements, lab measurements, but I'm going to suggest a setup and then point out to some of the problems that one might have and also the limitation of this method. To do the simulation, we need a model of a nonlinear inductor. I'm going to use here the built-in feature of empty spice, in which you define an inductor by having here an expression for the flux. And here it is like two milli times tangent hyperbolic of 0.1x. Now, x is the current through the inductor. Now, this function is very popular because the behavior of this function, as you can see here, really resembles a hysteresis loop of a ferromagnetic material, although it doesn't have the loop itself, doesn't have the, doesn't have the hysteresis, but we see here the behavior of a sort of saturation. Now, for these numbers, we expect a differential inductance of 200 microhenry because the derivative around zero of this time tangent hyperbolic 0.1x is 0.1 and then times 
two milli, it's uh, 200 microhenry. And so this is the idea of this uh, empty spice uh, model, which I'm going to use just to demonstrate the behavior of the nonlinear inductor as you pass through it DC current. So here is the setup that I'm going to use. Actually, we have here two circuits. One is the classical impedance type of testing. We have here a current source with a DC current and then AC component, 50 milliamp. Now, in the case of a simulation, LT spice is very convenient to have a current source with both DC and AC. This may not be practical in the lab to actually build the current source like that, but for simulation, it's pretty good. Here we have the inductor. This is an ESR, and then I'm going to sweep the DC current from 0 to 20 with steps of 0.5. And I'm measuring here the voltage, which is the voltage across the total inductor, and then uh, calculating the inductance as the voltage times 2 pi, 10k is the frequency of the signal of the excitation, and 50 milliohm is the peak value of the AC component, and then 0.7 because I like to have it in RMS, and also I'm measuring the voltage here in RMS value. So this is RMS over RMS. I should say that there is a problem with this method because if I'm injecting a sinusoidal current, then at high bias current, the voltage will be distorted, so it's not clear what should you use, either the peak or RMS. I'm using here the RMS, and there is some uncertainty here because of this um, nonlinearity of the inductor. And then on this side, I have this uh, one pulse emulation. And what we have here is a pulse of a DC voltage, and this is a 10 volt for 200 microseconds. This is again the inductor, same inductor here and here, of course. This is the ESR. And then the definition of the flux, as I've shown earlier. And here we have the calculation of this um, differential inductance using the equation of voltage divided by the derivative of the current. But in order to take into account the ESR, I am actually subtracting the drop of the ESR from the input voltage. Here it is. This is the input voltage. Oh, I show it, show it here. This is the voltage on the inductor, which is equal to the input voltage minus the drop on the ESR. So it will take into account, to some extent, the possible error of the ESR. I'll later on show that uh, in all practical cases uh, the difference is very small. So this is the expression here and the derivative is using here the operator, the LT spice operator of derivative DDT, the derivative of the current of the inductor. So this is the pulse approach and this is the impedance approach. So let's start with the impedance approach. As we sweep the current, the DC current, we get a voltage across the inductor, which is going down with the current, of course. This is time, and this is these are the runs of for different DC current. And then summarizing all this, which is a feature of uh, LT spice, and plotting it as a function of the current, we have here now the differential inductance. So as expected, it is 200 microhenry. And I've, I've here marked two points that I'm going to use later on to compare it to other runs. And one is at 6 amp, approximately 6 amp, which is 145 microhenry. And this one is 38.9 microhenry at 15 amp for this particular inductor. And again, the inductance is measured or calculated as the voltage over 2 pi f, the current, and these are AC components. Now here is the one pulse method. We have here the voltage, 10 volt for about 200 uh, microseconds, as I've said. Now we see the current in the beginning, the slope is sort of uh, almost constant. But then as the inductor is getting into saturation, 
the slope is becoming steeper and steeper because the inductance is decreasing. Here, uh, this is the end of the pulse, and then this is the discharge of the inductor through the ESR, as a matter of fact. This calculating the inductance as the voltage divided by the derivative of the current, which is done online while it's running. And this is now as a function of time, but this is of less importance. More interesting is that uh, if we plot it as a function of the current. And here we have again the differential inductance, 200 micro Henry to begin with. And then we have these values that I've marked here, 143, while in the impedance we found 145. And uh, here it is 37, while in the impedance uh, method we found 39, which is pretty close. So you see that this uh, method works pretty nice. One shot, one pulse, and that's it. Now I'm going to see what is the effect of an increased ESR. As I've said, due to the fact that uh, I'm subtracting the voltage across the ESR, I wouldn't expect much of a change. And indeed, if I look at the results, we see that it, it's about the same thing. It's 142 rather than 143 with the 10 milliohm. And here it's also a small difference between the 100 milliohm and the 10 milliohm. Now, what about the effect of the parasitic capacitance? And I'm showing here a very simple model in which there is a parallel capacitance to the whole inductor. This is not uh, very accurate, of course, but this is done in many cases as a first approximation. And I've put here a one nanofarad capacitor in parallel to this 200 uh, microhenry. And first thing I'm going to do is to run an AC analysis, that is a small signal AC analysis, just to see the resonant frequency of this combination. And here it is. I see that the resonance is at 350 kilohertz, so it's pretty low for practical inductor. Usually it'll be like one megahertz or even higher than that. And then with this capacitor, here is the behavior of this uh, one pulse method, and it sort of looks the same. And indeed, if I look at the end result of the inductance uh, calculated from the voltage and the derivative, uh, it's practic practically the same as without the capacitor. Now, when is the capacitance going to make a difference? If the measuring time is very short, well, you may not wish to do that because uh, if you are applying a short time, you need a much higher voltage. And so the current will shoot up very quickly, and this may not be a good idea. On the other hand, if the duration of the pulse is very long, when the voltage is low, then there is an issue of heating up of components, like if you're using a MOSFET as a switch, it's going to be heated up because of the longer time, but this can easily be optimized. So in practice, what can be done is indeed to have a MOSFET as a switch, to have the inductor. We need a diode, of course, in this case, to capture the current when the switch is off, and then to measure the voltage across the inductor and, of course, the current. Now, what are the limitations of this method? Well, first of all, we don't see effects which are related to high frequency, that is core loss and also the increase in the resistance due to the high frequency, as we call it, the RAC of the winding. This is not seen here. In order to see that, you do have to pass a high frequency signal through the inductor. And then we also we don't see another effect which is due to high frequency, that is the permeability drop as a function of the frequency. This measurement is actually done at, you might say, the low equivalent frequency, so that if one is really interested to see what is exactly happening at high frequency, not to mention the resonant point, etc., then of course uh, the impedance method has to be carried out. 
So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I hope you found it of interest and perhaps you can give it a try. Thank you very much for your attention.